On the other side of a storm is the strength that comes from navigating through it. Raise your sail and begin. Just because you're struggling doesn't mean that you're failing. I think sometimes people equate struggling with failure. It, it's, it's not, it isn't even close. In fact, if you're struggling, it tells me that you're still in the game. We don't see these incredible opportunities first because every opportunity that you and I have is surrounded by a problem. I've never gone to an opportunity that I didn't have to go to the door of problems first. So the next time you have an obstacle, a, a difficulty, an adversity in your life, don't allow the crisis to numb you. Be alive, learn, feel, fail, learn. That's what it's all about if you wanna make this difficult time a good time. I just want you to know that there's a hero within you. I know there is. And during this tough time, let the hero out. Let people see the best of you, your highest aspirations. You be the one who's the lifter and the encourager. Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Mark Cole. I have been with John Maxwell now 20 years and I've watched him in the last 20 years do what he's done in 53 years of this leadership message he's been proclaiming. He pivots, he pivots, and he pivots again. Any leaders out there leading understand what I mean when I say John Maxwell and leaders pivot? You're looking at a screen today and not only am I joined by John Maxwell who has been doing this program for some time, I'm joined by a leader that he respects, a guy that really needs no introduction, but Simon Sinek is a man with a mission, a man with a message, and a man that wants to add value to you today. So I'm gonna get out of the way, but let me explain what's gonna happen. You are a part of the Leadership When It Matters the Most program. John pivoted nine weeks ago when we couldn't do a live event and has spoken to over 2.2 million people on this program in the last eight weeks. Well, we've pivoted again because John's felt like his message has been said, and now it's time to introduce you to some friends of him and their message in these difficult times. Let me explain difficult times. We've had the COVID-19 health crisis. We're having the COVID-19 financial crisis and now we're having the George, George Floyd crisis. We are becoming acclimated to crisis. And so I, today's the program is about you. I've got some pre-submitted questions that we're going to throw over to John and Simon. And then in this program, I really wanna challenge you, go to the chat box and post your question. and Let us select your question to ask of John and Simon. John. Simon, thank you, John. I'm going to get out of the way and let you welcome your friend. And then I do have some questions for you guys. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Simon, good to have you, buddy. It's uh, so good to I see you. Love every time I'm with you, whether we're on stage or in the green room or out having dinner. You are a leader's leader. You are a thinker. Uh, you are a practitioner. You add value to me. You add value to everybody. You walk into our lives and you make us better. That's what leaders do. So Simon, having you on with us today, beautiful. And you are the guest. So what I mean by that is I've shared with Mark. I've said, Mark, we feature you. I mean, I'll come around and, and pick up a few pieces once in a while too. We got to, but, but you're the man. You're the man. And uh, I want to make sure that uh, your message and your thoughts are given to the people. So uh, thanks for coming and being with us. Sure. Love you, man. Thanks, John. Go ahead, Mark. Thanks. The feeling's mutual. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, and, and before the program is over, we're going to give you some additional ways to get more impact and value from Simon and his team. So stay tuned for that. Guys, I'm going to ask both of you this question, Simon, first to you, but you guys have spent your life at whatever level and length that is, you've spent your life really for your platform and your message. Simon, for you, that message is you've got to start with why and you've got to be in the infinite game. 
as you are seeing yourself and others deal with crisis after crisis after crisis in this current time, what about your message is digging deeper into yourself? And what are you learning that further accents the way that we can apply your message in difficult times? So crisis is the great revealer. Um, when a crisis hits, everything that may have been hidden or hard to see becomes easy to see. Um, uh, everything from um, how we operate, um, how we deal with stress, uh, uh, the quality of our relationships, the, the, the quality of our corporate culture, the quality, I mean, everything, everything is revealed instantaneously. Um, you know, we can't judge the quality of a crew by how a ship performs in calm waters. We judge the quality of a crew by how a ship performs in rough waters. And the thing that I found um, comforting, quite frankly, is that uh, because my work is about building strong foundations, you know, the concept of why is a foundation of a house that if a hurricane comes through um, and does damage to the house, the foundation is fixed. You know, when we, we dig up ancient ruins, we, we find the foundations. That's what we find. And so um, what I've learned is that in, in a time where, you, where we need to respond to crisis, you, you go back to basics, you go back to the foundation, that I can change what I do. I can change how I bring my message to the world. I can change the product that I'm selling. All of that is flexible. But the thing that has remained completely fixed that I've been able to pivot around is my why, is my cause. And so when, we, when, when COVID happens, for example, um, you know, we make most of our income from, from live events. And that uh, disappeared. And so um, we didn't go back to the team and said, how are we going to do more live events, but online? You know, we didn't just take the old business model and try and shove it online. We said, okay, imagine that the old business never existed. We have this cause to inspire people to do the things that inspire them. We have this, we have this vision of the world that we imagine to, to build a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe wherever they are, and end the day fulfilled by the work that they do. That we have all these resources, we have all of this content, what are we going to do with it? And we literally built an entirely new business. Um, but the foundation, the most important thing to answer your question is the foundation never, never changed. So what I found incredibly comforting is I've gone back to my own work um, and used that as the basis for, to, to provide some kind of stability in all the work and all the change that's happening around us. So John, um, I know you're, you may want to even bounce off of that, but I, I want to ask you the same question. You, you've made your life about the statement, everything rises and falls on leadership. And yet we're seeing in media today, we're seeing in COVID-19, we're seeing in the globe, the national response to um, George Floyd, we're, we're seeing uh, leadership in some form or fashion. What are you finding out about leadership and its importance in today's realities? Well, I want to play off what Simon just said about the crisis being the great revealer. I agree completely with that. And one of the things that crisis reveals is the players from the pretenders. When it comes, when it comes to leadership, again, a pretender can hide in normal times. They can hide behind their titles, their positions, uh, the political aspect of what they're doing as a leader. So they can, during easy times, you can hide. But when it comes to crisis, it squeezes out of every one of us who we really are. And when I, here's what I mean by the difference between a player and a pretender as far as the leader is concerned. Um, for example, uh, 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 players immediately go to where the needs of the people are. Pretenders, they have a tendency to always make sure that they look right. They look good. It's players, pretenders are all about how my position and, and players are all about where are the people? Because wherever the people are, that's the people that we have to lead. We have to, you have to, you have to find them before you can lead them. And, and so you, I think you begin to find out uh, the pretenders have an agenda during a crisis. And the, the agenda is how can, again, how can I look good on this where the players, they be, they just say, where are the people and how can I serve you? And how can I add value to you? And it's all hands on deck. And, and yes, we've had to let go of everything we've basically done, but it's okay. The, and the players, the players want the ball during a crisis. And the pretenders, they, they don't want the ball. They don't want the ball. They, they want to be on the ball team. They want to, if you think of basketball, they want to be on the side. They want to throw the ball into someone else so that they're seen. But the players want the ball. I remember John Wooden many years ago, we had a discussion. He said, I don't even like to pick my captain of my basketball team 
until we're three or four games in. Because he said, I want to watch the players play during the, during the tightness of the game. He said, I want to watch which one of my players really wants the ball when there's a minute left and the score's tied. Who, who wants the ball? Because that should be the captain. So what happens is in this revealer that, you know, Simon said, which is so true, what happens is the players really, really shine. They come forth and, and the pretenders, uh, they, 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 they start hiding. In fact, truthfully, all of you that are watching this right now, this is a great time for you to find out who on your team is a player versus who's a pretender. So anyway, where everything rises and falls on leadership, the thing that's discouraging me to the most at this time is so many people that have, quote, leadership positions, their agenda is, honest to God, it's just so wrong. It, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because it's bad enough to manipulate people during good times, but it's compounding worse, manipulating people during difficult times. And so everything rises and falls on leadership, but sadly, a lot of positional leaders we have, they're not really leading, leading well at all right now. And that, that's really, it's revealing, Simon. It's what you just said. It's really revealing right now. I, you know, John, you're, you're, you're what I've seen, I've seen in the marketplace, you, you, you're hundred percent right. Even at a company standpoint, which is the companies that are uh, more successfully pivoting their businesses versus the ones that are really struggling. And the ones that are struggling to pivot have put themselves at the center of the equation. How can we survive? How can we get more money? How can we, it's about us, right? The ones that are more successfully pivoting are the ones that have put the customer at the center of the equation. We've got stuff. How are we going to help them? We, we've got things that they need. How are we going to get it to them? And, and, and though, of course, they need to make money, they, they've done it with an absolute focus on the outside versus an absolute focus on themselves. Um, so this, this, you, you, what you're saying is, 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 is playing out in the marketplace right now. Yeah, and just one, one other quick thought then, Mark. You, we'll go right back to you, buddy. And that is you also talked about, Simon, about it's not a revealer, but you talked about the foundation. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and to me, values are the foundation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and let me tell you something. My values don't change. My, value, yeah. my values don't That's change. Correct. Good times, bad times, they're, they're the same values. People first, right. adding value to people. And, and so what I find in so many of the pretenders is, again, they, they don't go for where their values are. They, they go for what, again, is what's convenient for me, what's going to make me look good. Again, uh, you know, as you said it so well, leaders go last. Leaders go last. They serve. And... Um, so anyway, you, you started us off good, Simon. The revealer, foundational stuff, buddy. Uh, hey, that's why you're on here. You're the pro. Hey, let's go. Let's go to Ty. He is from Virginia Beach. And Ty, this is back on this leadership. And Simon, we'll go to you first, and then John, you just jump right in. Ty says many of the tensions we're experiencing are because leaders have failed to listen. How can we become better listeners? And secondly. How do we change from just hearing someone's perspective to actually listening to that perspective? Well, asked and answered. Um, you know, the we we can't we can make demands of our leaders, but at the end of the day, we can only be responsible for ourselves. Like we can't change our leaders when we can we can vote them in and out, or we can or we can you know choose to 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 get a different job somewhere, but we can't physically actually change the way that they're going to do business or how they see the world. You know, no number of anonymously sent books is going to solve that problem. Um, um, uh, but we can change ourselves. And you know, when when I hear people talking about the system is broken, there's no mythical system. It's us. It's a. It's a. Our society is a collection of individuals, and and whatever the the balance of behavior is from those individuals is the is the system you get. And so it starts at home. It starts with us. And so we want to change the system. This 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 elephant. The only way to eat an elephant is one mouthful at a time. And so I think we need to um, set ourselves on a course to become better listeners ourselves. And there's a difference between listening and hearing. You know, hearing is understanding the words that are said to you. Listening is trying to get to the meaning of the words that are said to you with an appreciation that sometimes people say the wrong thing. They say what they're trying to say badly. Sometimes emotions are involved. Sometimes they get flustered. And it's not for us to take their words uh, personally or even to even pick apart, but to rather try and show up with curiosity to, to really understand the meaning. What I'm describing is empathy. We, we show up with empathy. That's, that's all this is. Um, 
um, and, we, and 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 to look past the the the, the superficial. I've I've heard it now, you know, um, which is, you know, talking about some of the anger. Like if they weren't angry, then we'd probably get more. They, this would be more productive. Well, do you understand why they're angry? Do do you let, let's go to the root? That's what listening is. Hmm. Um, uh, it was Martin Luther King who said, "Riots are the language of the unheard." Remember, we all know what it feels like to feel heard, to feel heard. And, the, and to what listening is, it's the practice, um, it's the practice that another person will feel heard. You know, just to go off on a, on a quick aside, you know, there's this, there's this trend in, in America today. Everybody's talking about being present. You know, everybody's mindful, everybody's doing yoga, everybody's trying to be present. You know, I, I, was a, I attended a meeting where uh, the, there was a, a big timey yoga instructor who was sitting next to me. Um, and um, the entire meeting, she was on her phone. Um, and uh, underneath the table. And it wasn't like she had a grandparent in the hospital or something. I could see she was on social media. You know, I, I was sitting right next to her. And at one point we started talking about being present and her head popped up and said, that's why I love yoga. It helps me be present. <laughs> I mean, I don't think she understands it. You are not present. You don't get to decide when you are present. You are present when somebody else says you are. Wow. And this is why we practice things like meditation. I mean, for anybody who's ever done a meditation practice, we learn to sit in silence to focus on one thing, a sound or a mantra. We learn to clear our minds. And if we have a thought, we label a thought, we put it out of our minds. We find this Zen-like state. But that's not for you. You practice yoga, you practice meditation, you practice mindfulness as a service to another human being. So that when you are sitting across a table, that when they are speaking, you have learned to focus on only what they're saying and not if your, your phone is buzzing or some noise behind you. And, and if you have a thought, you're not just waiting for your turn to speak, but rather you label it a thought, you put out of your mind, and you remain focused on what they're saying. And you try to learn and understand the motivation, the emotion underneath. And at the end, you will know you have been present when that person says, thank you. I feel heard. Thank you for listening to me. I appreciate you being here for me are the words they will use when you have been present. And so I think the question about listening is we have to go on the journey. It's a skill like any other. It is a learnable, practicable skill. And if you don't practice, you lose that skill. One book I would recommend, it's called How to Talk to Kids uh, So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. It's a bright yellow book. Yes, it's a parenting book. It's one of the best books to teach us to listen to adults as well. Um, but it's a skill, and if you want to learn it, I encourage you to to literally go out and learn it and practice and practice and practice. You know, Simon. John, I want. You, go ahead. John, I want you to jump in. Simon, what's the name of that book again? How to talk to kids so kids will listen and listen so kids will talk. It's a great title. It's more of a paragraph, but still good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Simon, when you talk about uh, listening. Uh, I, in my young, in my young leadership years, I was not a good listener at all. Yeah, I was so visionary, and I I knew so desperately where I wanted to go that it was basically, can I get you on my leadership train? And this is the way we're going. And I was directional. I was I was motivational. And I said, let's go. And and I had a staff member really come into my life one time and just look at me and say, you don't listen to us. And of course, I, I protested until I went home to my, <laughs> to my wife. And, and I said, Margaret, you know, you know, Susan says I don't listen to the staff. And she said, well, she's right. <laughs> and then I go, oh, I'm, now I'm in real deep weeds. And, and, mm -hmm. and so I had to really turn this around. And, and here's what I discovered about me, okay? Mm -hmm. The reason that I didn't listen well is because I valued what I wanted more than I mm -hmm. valued what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I had to I had to turn that around. You know, the old Zig Ziglar thing, if you'll help people get what they want, they'll help you get what, everything you need. Well, what I discovered is, again, I've got to go find them before I can lead them. And so I became, I changed from a directional leader to a, to a conversational leader that basically mm -hmm. asked a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so my favorite definition of listening, because it works for me, is listening mm -hmm. is wanting to hear. I, mm -hmm. I, I want to hear. And I, lo I love it when you said that the person that validates if you're present isn't mm -hmm. yourself. It's like, wow, was mm -hmm. I present? The other, Boy, was I present today? Yeah. Yeah. They're the ones. And there's not a higher compliment to give to people than to, than to be present 
and ask questions and value their input and ask for it. That's a high compliment. What, what's your opinion? What do you think? And what I found is that the great leaders, that they, they listen, they learn, and then they lead. And they ask a question and genuinely care about the answer. Absolutely. Even if the question is, how are you? Yeah. Yes. It's, how are you? And genuinely care about the answer. Yeah, you got it. A guy, a friend of John's, Andy Stanley, um, did a, a talk recently about leading in crisis. And he said, every one of you leaders that are leading in times like this, you need to start your meeting with going around asking the question, how are you yeah. really? And uh, we did that right after I heard the talk. We did that an hour later. These leaders that all they want to usually talk about is bottom lines. They was telling about their moms that going through this mm. issue, that issue. And it really bound us together, even though it was on a Zoom call, a, a visual mm. call like this. It really was a connecting point. Hey, Simon, I want to go to you first for the next question. It's from Dominic from St. Louis. And by the way, if you're watching, go to the chat box, list a question. We want to get your question in front of Simon and John Maxwell. Uh, this question from Dominic St. Louis says, what is the best way for a leader to break out of a short-term mindset and embrace a mindset better suited for the infinite game? Um, well, the mindset is the infinite mindset. Um, so, um, the way to break out of it is to actually sit down and say, what game am I in? Um, the Being in the infinite game is not the absence of finite games. It's the context within which the finite games exist. And um, we use the wrong metaphors and analogies to describe our lives, our businesses. Um, and so most of the um, metaphors that we use reinforce the finite mindset. We use sports analogies all the time. We use war analogies all the time. This is a campaign. We're launching this, you know? Um, uh, it's, it's fourth and goal and we have to, you know, this is how we talk to our teams about making, you know, the end of the year numbers or something. Um, and the reality is the, the, the analogies are all wrong because these are games that have no finish lines. These are infinite games. And so we have to change, change our mentality of, of, of how it's playing. And I like to think of it more like lifestyle. Um, so for example, like being healthy, you can absolutely have finite goals. I want to lose X amount of weight by X date. It's a finite number. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an arbitrary number and an arbitrary date, just like we said, arbitrary financial goals for arbitrary dates. Same thing, right? Sales goals, all of it. It's all arbitrary, right? Um, and we like numbers. Metrics are really important. It helps people feel like they're making progress. You could never run a marathon without mile markers because it's unnerving. And we have to remember metrics are there to help us uh, understand speed and distance, but they don't indicate the end of the game. It's speed and distance. And so it's wonderful and we, we weigh ourselves every day and we're exercising, we're eating right and we can see the weight come off. And if we hit our goal, we feel excited. And here's the worst part. You have to keep exercising and eating healthy for the rest of your life because the game does not end. Congratulations, you hit your goal. Now you have to keep going and going and going. It's a different mind frame, different mindset. Also, what happens if you miss your goal? Do you know what happens if you miss your goal? Nothing. Nothing happens if you miss your goal. It was arbitrary. But if you've been eating healthy and exercising, the odds are you'll hit that goal in a month or so. You're fine. In fact, you're probably way healthier now than when you started because the metrics were there. The finite, go the finite game is there to help you make progress in the infinite game. That's the role of the finite game. That's the role of many of those finite games. The infinite game is the context within which those finite games exist. But if we don't have vision, if we don't have a cause, if we don't have a place that we're trying to go to, then the only thing we have are the finite things. The only thing we have are those finite metrics. And that's why we become so obsessed with them because that's all we've got. Wow. That's all we've got. And so you want to have that distant view of a, of a more idealized state of the world, which is different than a BHAG, different than a big, hairy, audacious goal. This is not achievable in 25 years. This is not achievable in your lifetime. All men are created equal. 240 years, still not there, right? But all of the milestones that we pass, we're trying to get there and all of them are imperfect. But you can see a nation struggling to get somewhere. It's the same at a micro level. To have a vision of service, to have a vision of a world, the way John talks about his business, the way John talks about his work and all of the things he's doing are the micro games, the finite games that help him measure progress towards this grander, this grander thing. And by the way, that is what gives our lives and our work meaning that the finite metrics actually are adding up towards something bigger. 
Oh, that's good stuff. Can I can I pitch for can I everybody if you're on you here's a, you've got to get Simon's book, The Infinite Game. I, I, I'm telling you, you got to get it. <laughs> and, and the reason you have to get it is I I've read every one of your books, Simon. Okay. Thank you, John. I truly think this is to me now. Every book speaks to you based on where you are. So so when somebody says it's a great book, it became great because that what what was said in that book is is coming right up to where I am personally. The infinite game was incredible because when I started off, I was goal oriented. And, and so I laid out my goals. In fact, my first personal growth kit was goals and how to set goals. And so I did, and it was kind of like, how long will it take? How long will it take? How long will it take? And one day in my personal growth, because of the changes happening in me, I, I went from how long will it take to how far can I go? And, and, and that was my first introduction to the infinite game. All of a sudden, I realized, oh, my. And then I began to understand there really is no finish line. That, 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 that the, the, the metrics are, are finishing are, are, are not finishing lines. They're, they're indicators of how far you've gone. But, but it, it, you know, if you have a finish line, if you play a finite game and that's all you have, you don't have the, the bigger infinite game. The problem is when you cross the finish line, as you know, Simon, you're finished. I mean, it's over. And how many times do we see people? Yeah. You know, They've already died. They just haven't made it official. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it, it, you, you see this in companies, right? We want to be the biggest. We want to be number one. So what happens if you achieve that? Do you shut the doors? You've, you've accomplished your goal. Shut Dave, the doors. The Dave game is over. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's so true. Hey, John, I, 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 I want to hear from you. You want to get that book. Make sure they get the book, Mark. Thank they you, John. They want to get it. Absolutely. So, so, John, I want to um, I want to go to you with this next question. But, uh, Simon, I would love to hear you ask uh speak into it as well. It's Tim from Creedmoor, North Carolina. He said, with so much pain and distrust and tension in our society right now, how do we navigate long lasting transformational change, John? Well, a, a couple of things. Um, it's a great, it's a great question. <sighs> Let, let's talk about trust. Let's just talk about trust. Um, in fact, I think there are three questions that all followers ask of a leader. And the three questions are, uh, do you like me? Uh, can you help me? And can I trust you? And I think those are three very valid questions. I mean, who wants to follow a leader that doesn't like them? Because the first thing they'll do is they'll manipulate you and, and move you for their advantage. Who wants to follow a leader that's incompetent? Hello, you're not gonna get where you wanna go with that. But this issue of trust, and, and so what I, what I say to myself all the time is, that's not the question followers should be asking me. That's the question I should be asking myself. It goes back to what Simon was saying again, when the quote system is broken, we're the system. Hey, wait a minute. Quit looking for someone else to bail us out, lead us up. Let's look at ourselves and say, what am I doing? How do I get involved? How do I improve myself? How do I get better? So every day, every day I'm asking myself that question. You know, do I really love the people that I lead? Because honestly, if I don't love them, I ought to get out of the leadership game. I mean, there's is there anything worse than a leader that doesn't love his or her people? I mean, and care for them? So and, and, and if I'm if I'm incompetent, I ought to get out of the leadership game, or that's for sure, or learn how to lead. But but this whole issue of trust, am I a trustworthy person? Am, am I a person and, and there's a there's a huge responsibility on trustworthiness. You know, Pat Lenciona has this new book out. I think it's called Motives. And he basically asked, why do leaders lead? And he said, there's two reasons. They either lead for reward. In other words, what's in it for me? Or they lead for responsibility, which, which responsibility is heavy. When you sign up for leadership, this is not an easy course. And, 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 and responsibility means I'm my brother's keeper. And, and those people are first. And, and so I think when you talk about something that's long lasting, not a quick fix, those are three questions we just need to ask ourselves and uh, forget about the followers asking. In fact, let me ask, just say one thing. The moment the follower has to ask the question you're not asking yourself, you're already behind. And, and so, you know, get out in front and, and ask the questions first and, and set the bar of excellence for yourself before somebody else has to set it for you. Go ahead, Simon. You know, I, I like to think of things when people ask societal questions, how does how do we restore trust? How do we build trust? I always like to think of these things in much smaller, more understandable 
context. I think of interpersonal relationships, right? Um, how do you build? How do we build trust with one person? Um, we all know how to do that. Um, sometimes it's quicker and sometimes it's slower, but it's not immediate. Um, it takes time and it takes reinforcement. And what happens if you violate trust? Like what happens if you do something that violates the trust of a friend, of somebody who who you care about and who cares about you? And they say to you, I, how can I trust you? And simply doing what you used to do or simply promising that you can still trust me, I made a mistake. Even if you come clean and say, I made a mistake, there still needs to be now, you got to double down on working even harder. And that... And 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 you got to prove it, and you've got to and 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 you know one of the things I can't stand is is leaders who say prove to me why I should trust you. Mm. Leaders have to take the risk of trust the day they show up. Yeah. If you declare yourself a leader, you take the risk of trust. It's the opposite. It's the leaders who have to prove why they're trustworthy to their people. That's right. Yes, and we we get the equation backwards all the time. <laughs> leaders take the risk of risk to trust, but the rest of us, you got to earn our trust. That's why, because, I love, because you, Simon, that's why I love the quote. It's wonderful when the people trust the leader, but it's even more wonderful when the leader trusts the people. The, and, and, and trust is a risk. It's like love is a risk. Like yeah. you didn't get to choose your children. You love them, right? I get, well, I didn't get to choose my team. Tough. You got to trust them. <laughs> like you, you got to love them too. Yeah. Um, and if they, if they fail, you don't immediately assume that there's something wrong with them. You go in and 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 you and again we'll go back to what we said before. You lead with empathy. Are you okay? What's going on? We don't know what their history is. We don't know who their former boss was. We don't know. Maybe they've come from a horrible corporate culture and they've just joined your company and they don't trust anybody. And so they're going to operate to protect themselves. We don't know. And that goes back to those listening skills. Um, and and uh, I, I think just think of it as, as as interpersonal and how we as individuals would have to act to build trust with another human being and now amplify that. And you'll see how uh, institutions have to act in a way to rebuild trust uh, with populations as well. I love that way of communicating and teaching, Simon. It, it, it just simplifies everything when you forget about the corporations and the teams and you just break it down to a one on one relationship and say, how's this how's this going to work? And, and because how it works in one on one is how it works with everyone. Turns turns out organizations and societies are just collections of individuals. That's correct. And, and individuals, you know, if you can understand the individual, you can understand the society because societies act the same way as individuals. That's exactly right. It's true. It's true for companies. It's true for countries. It's true for where we are now. Hey, let's go, let's go to our live audience gang. We've been doing some pre submitted questions. I'm going to go to our live audience and Sandra K Reynolds asked the question, how do you address and work with people who refuse to make necessary pivots during this time, Simon? Again, um, when we say refuse, right? We don't know. We don't know where they're coming from, um, especially in a time like this, in a time of crisis. Trauma affects people in different ways. Um, some people go into go mode, mission mode. They're they're you know they're all they're actually kind of enjoying it because it's 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 that's it's just go 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 and some people shut down and there's no right or wrong and the thing that we have to remember is there's no such thing as compartmentalizing uh there's no such thing as compartmentalizing your feelings everyone will have to deal with the trauma at some point and i've been issuing this warning i've been calling friends in the military when covid started i called a bunch of friends and said hey how do i compartmentalize my my emotions so i can stay focused in go mode because you guys compartmentalize your emotions all the time when you're in when you're in mission mode, right? And my friend said to me, he gave me a warning. He said, do not think you can do that. He said, you can do it for a short period of time, like when we're in a combat situation. Sure. Yes, it's compartmentalized. But the pain comes later. The pain comes when everything stops. He says, we have huge problems with folks coming back from combat, sometimes two, three months after they they've been home. All of a sudden, the trauma flies in. This is where we see PTS. And you see increases in domestic violence, in depression, in alcohol abuse, worst case self-harm, anger, somebody, people on hair trigger. And so no one is going to get off this scot-free. We're all going to have to deal with the trauma at some point. So if you've been in mission mode and you're gonna be, you've been in go mode, it's coming. It's coming when it stops. Think about the doctors and nurses on the front line, right? We've been calling them heroes and clapping them to work every day. That ends at some point and they just go back to being doctors and nurses. And the trauma is going to flood in. But the same goes for us. And so if somebody refuses 
to pivot. Be, be, try, uh, go and sit down with them and understand where maybe they're dealing with the trauma right now. Maybe they don't know how to act. Maybe they're uh, operating out of extreme fear because they don't know what the future is. This is one of the one of the advantages of learning to embrace an infinite mindset. An infinite mindset sees change or uncertainty as opportunity, embracing opportunity, love surprises. Finite mindset hates surprises. That's why there's planning, 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 because I want to make sure that I'm prepared for every eventuality so that there's no surprises. Unfortunately, there's going to be surprises. Um, the, the, the finite mindset sees all the creativity that happened in the past. This is what James Cars explains. Um, uh, whereas the infinite mindset sees all the creativity happens at the moment of change. Okay, what are we going to do? This is where the fun begins. As opposed to looking past and say, what can we, what, what can we rely on? We say, how can we reinvent? Um, but that's just one of the, the little advantages. But if somebody refuses, I would say start with empathy. And if they really still can't, then just leave them be. Let they'll come in their own time. Maybe they won't come at all. But but we don't want to criticize and we don't want to lean heavy into them because we do not know. We do not know. And next time that could be us. No, and you know what, Simon, what you said is so right on. The other thing is very true is, you know, assumption is the mother of all leadership mess ups. And, and, and the very fact that they refuse to pivot, my first question was, would be, how do you know that? Now, what you see is visually that they're maybe not moving as quickly and turning as fresh, but, but you've got to go sit down with them and ask the questions. You, you have to find out where they are again and find out the setting because what I've discovered so many times is what I assume by someone's behavior is based on their actions but I've never spent time to find out what their intentions are and what their motives are. And a lot of times the, the very fact of connecting, finding, uh, empathizing, many times this opens up. If they're refusing with an outward action, many times once you have a heart connection with them and, and, and you both under, have an understanding, all of a sudden you just remove that clog and they can and, and they can move on. Again, it's the leader's responsibility to go where the people are, not the people's responsibility to go where the leader are. And I think that's one of the big misses we have in leadership, Simon. You you got it so right. And by the way, I went through this and I got it wrong on my own team and my own pivot in, at the beginning of COVID, um, which is we're making this pivot. I'm in mission mode. I'm in go mode. I'm like, all right, we're going to do this. And one of the senior members of my team just kept referring to the past and couldn't get out of her own way. And it was, and every phone call felt like I was taking two steps back. And, and I, and, and, and I got so frustrated and I'd call her up after the call and be like, come on, you got to pick it up. Like, we're trying to do this. Like, I need you, you know? Um, and it just kept not working. And I kept getting frustrated and she got frustrated with me and she got frustrated. And then I took a deep breath and said, I think she's just scared or uncertain. I don't know what it is. So I called her up and said, A, I'm sorry. And B, I thanked her for being in the struggle because I know she was trying. I know that she was trying. Um, and I thanked her for being in the struggle. And I told her that um, I'll be there with her through the struggle. Immediately everything changed yeah, yeah. because it no longer became adversarial. And I, I had more empathy for the fact that she wasn't, in, in, in excitement go mode with me. And I couldn't use how I felt to, to, to judge her performance. It was un grossly unfair. But the minute I thanked her for, for, she didn't quit. She didn't shut down. She didn't run away. She jumped in with me. She was just, it was just, it was a struggle. And when I just thanked her for being in the thick of it, it was amazing what changed. It was amazing what changed. Great example, Simon. Great example. Yeah, you know, and, and John, I'm going to go to Garrett, our next uh, question. But it, it's funny to, that you say that because this past weekend I spoke to two of our African-American executives and just said, talk to me. Just let me hear you and, and let me let, help me give give me some verbiage. Give me some context. John, you did that on Monday. You, you pivoted your whole program and said, I've got to speak to where we are now. And I think great leaders that do that get that connection, Simon, that you're just talking about. And that connection is what's going to carry us through because we do need all of us and what we bring to the table to be able to get through some of these uh, times. In fact, that is Garrett Vita's question. He's from Los Angeles. 
catch where he's from and what he's seeing every night in Los Angeles. Here's his question. What are, what actions, what are some action steps we should take now due to the complications of what's currently happening? Obviously he's talking about in our cities and our streets. Simon. Um, so I can only respond with what I'm doing. Um, I, I don't think there's an answer. Um, I'm trying to have a lot of uncomfortable conversations. Um, I'm calling friends. Um, I'm calling my black friends. I'm calling my white friends. I'm having uncom uncomfortable conversations and I'm asking them for advice and I'm asking them um, how they feel. Um, and I'm, and I'm learning. And um, if, if, if somebody feels guilt, then it probably means because you can relate to what's going on. Uh, if somebody, if, if somebody feels, you know, if, if there's somebody, uh, um, uh, somebody who's white, who's feeling guilty about something, it's probably because you recognize that there's white privilege and, and, and you know it, and that's okay. The important thing is to sit with these emotions and to express these emotions. And I'm having uncomfortable conversations and I'm having comforting conversations, but I think that's what we have to do. I think this is a, this is like, we have to go through this collective therapy um, and we have to do it with the people we know and the people we love. I think we have to start really close to home. I had a conversation the other day with um, some business leaders and they're asking me questions about what public statements they should make. And they made these public statements. They put out these statements. And I'm like, well, have you, have you actually gone and sat down and talked to your team and let everybody just say how they feel? They said, no. I said, well, why don't you start internally and not worry about what the legally approved public statement is, you know, like start talking inside. That's way more important right now check in with people. I said, have you called all of your black employees and just said, Hey, how are you? Um, have you had, have you had, have you put 10, 15 people around a table around a zoom room? Have you had a, a, a team call and just said, Hey, this is a safe space. I, let's just go. Anybody want to say how they feel. And by the way, whether you like it or not, the leaders have to lead by example. We, we did a team call where we just went around the room and said, anybody who have anything on their mind, but I started. And it has to be genuine and heartfelt. It can't just be like, this is a safe space. Tell us what you think. Leader, leaders got to put it all out there. And all the discomfort warts and all so that people know that they can do that without judgment. Um, but I think this is what we've done. I think, you know, we, we live in a society that has over-indexed on, on machismo. We've, in, we've live in a society that has over-indexed on individuality, rugged individualism, you know, John, you and I have joked about this before. We have an entire section in the bookshop called self-help. We have no section in the bookshop called help others. We've, we've over-indexed on individual performance and individual wealth, and yet the collective and service, we've just kind of forgotten over the past 30, 40 years. Um, just, just to put it in, into perspective, it, during World War II, there were more cases of, of young men committing suicide who didn't get drafted. Think about that for a second. The shame of not being called to service was more traumatic than being called to service. And, you know, service used to be normal. Like chivalry used to be the normal way of doing business, that your word was your bond and that you could go to war if you violated values. Uh, um, uh, service used to be a, a normal thing. Now we talk about it like you're lucky to get it um, in, in companies. Um, you know, handshake deals used to be like a real thing. Um, um, and I think we've, as a society, we've forgotten what it means to do things for others. And by the way, service is a very specific definition. It means sacrificing your interests for the good of another human being's life. Sacrificing your interest, it, there ha you cannot have service without sacrifice. And it doesn't have to be your life. It could be time. It can be energy. It could be money. It could be your attention. You know, think about how your kids feel when you're actually turn to them and talk to them and look at them versus talking to them while you're on your phone. That's an act of service, putting this away, sacrificing that I'll have to just have more emails and work later because I'm going to put this away. That's the sacrifice I'm going to make for my child or for my spouse. And I think we've, we've forgotten about service. You can't, service is not giving a donation. That's not service. The only time money becomes of service is if you give more money than you have to give, then it's a service. But if you give, you know, a hundred bucks and you make $200,000 a year, it's nice. It's a nice gesture. Keep doing it. It's not service. Uh, service has to come with sacrifice. 
Um, and I think that's that's what we're learning right now. You know, Simon, uh, you just defined service wonderfully for all of us. But you've also, you defined service for us, but you showed us humility. And, 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 and really, Simon, uh, we're over our heads. And, and, and it, a crisis ought to bring humility to all of us. We don't have answers. And the only way that we're going to get the answers is by humbling ourselves and going to other people and having uncomfortable conversations. I don't mind the uncomfortable conversations. I just like the, uh, the, the, what happened. I don't like what happens when you have an uncomfortable conversation and you still feel uncomfortable after because you haven't done what you need to do to begin to change and, and, and begin to understand things from their perspective or their point of view. But I think, um, you know, probably my proudest time to be American was right after 9-11 for about three months. There was such a sense of humility. I, I, mean, I mean, politicians just started reaching across the aisle and, and, and started truly kind of may, maybe putting the people first. That's what a, what a novel thought for a politician. But I mean, it was it, uh, the people were, they were very humbled because we didn't have answers and we don't have answers today either. And, and, and there's no room for arrogance in leadership. And, and there's no room for um, uh, personal rights in leadership. Is, and and, and uh, I think that when you are calling your friends and having uncomfortable conversations, what you're basically saying is, I have to be uncomfortable and humble myself so that I can come, first of all, to grips with me. It's again, it's not how do I fix society? It's how do I fix me? What, well, the good news is once I kind of get fairly fixed, I can go help some other people because you only, but you only can give what you have. And so I, I think you described service great for us, Simon, but I think you modeled with your phone conversations example, humility, which all of us need to exhibit at this time. Hey, I want to thank you. Th thank you, John. I think you give me too much credit, but the, I, I can tell you because I've done it uncomfortably a number of times and I've got it wrong a bunch of times that there's an easy, there's an easier way. There's a simple way. It's not easy. It's simple. There's a simple way to start these conversations, which is to pick up the phone and the first words out of your mouth are, I need help. Yeah. It's... Or, I'm, or, or I'm stuck. Yeah. Or I don't know what to do, which is why I'm calling you. Which they become an ally or, immediately to you. That now, or, or, now... or, I'm, or, or my, my thoughts are conflicting and I need to talk them out, please. Yeah. Like to, 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 that's, how the com that's how my conversations all started. Right on. Right on, friend. Right on. I'd like to close with two quick questions and then some closing comments, uh, perhaps from the both of you. Al from New York, going to the other side of the United States, Al from New York says, can there be or will there be another Lincoln, Kennedy or Dr. Martin Luther King who will emerge and help us out of these times? I, I, I keep holding out hope. Um, you know, what what we have to remember that what these great leaders do, um, you know, there was plenty of civil rights abuses prior to Dr. Martin Luther King for for decades, decades and decades. Um what Dr. King was did was he took all of that frustration, he took what people were railing against, and he made a stand for something. And he talked and he and he painted a vision of the future, a positive vision of the future. Instead of talking about the um, he didn't, he, 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 the, the, the dream was not a discussion of the broken past. The dream was a discussion of the, was of the, the, the affirmative future. I have a dream that one day little black children will play on the playground with little white children. And it's the world we want to build. And we, and we make this mistake all the time. You see it a lot in, 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 in charitable works. You know, they show you the picture of the, of the child with the distended belly, you know, to get you to give to, to hunger. You know, they'd show you the person on the hospital bed or the abused animal to get you to give. But they don't show you the healthy animal or the person who survived cancer or the person who 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 used to be hungry to show us where what we, what your money goes towards. And and I think um, we we need leaders to tell us where we're going. Not just we, we want to stand for something. Nobody wants to break things. We want to build things. You know, I, I, I joke even like with unemployment numbers. It's like, well, unemployment is down to, you know, 8%. Well, who wants to move something down? I want to get unemployment close to 100%. I want to say unemployment is up to 96%. Let's get it higher. 
You know, like I want to build. I don't want to break. I don't want to destroy or bring down. And that's what these the the leaders that that he mentions that you know they they all presented their the what we can join, where we're going. Um. Um. Yeah. There, there will be another Martin Luther King. I, I, I promise you. There will be because the problem with the crisis that we're in is we always think it's the greatest crisis that's ever happened. And that's not true. And uh, in fact, I was talking the other day, Simon, about the fact that we even look at these times and say, this may be the most troubling time in America. I, I can tell you, go back to the 1960s and and, 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 and Malcolm X and, and, and JFK were assassinated two years apart. Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King were assassinated two months apart. You know, riots in the street, the cities were burning. You know, Vietnam War morale was an all-time low. And I think the tendency is for us to look at our crisis and say, well, mm. this has got to be the worst and, 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 mm. and the darkest days we've ever had. Man, I don't believe that, mm. but here's what I do believe. I believe that there's it's an impossibility to have a crisis mm. without the emergence of great leadership. I, it, because that's that's where they are revealed and that's where and that's where they began to get their stride, their leadership stride. I think many of those, I think, I think Abraham Lincoln is just an average person and a, and a lawyer in Springfield, Illinois, until a crisis called the greatness out of him. And all of a sudden people mm -hmm. were surprised. And I think that's the other thing. I think we get surprised by, by sometimes the person that does step up. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very much uh, positive that, that mm -hmm. the great, the bad times, rise up with great leaders. Yeah. I just think that they will. Yeah. Hey, well, I would love, so maybe to close out your, your thoughts. And then again, I do want to give some people ways to stay connected with you, Simon, and mm -hmm. a couple of things, John, for you. But um, the so Tony from Seattle asked a question that maybe this can kind of be the way you guys give us some closing thoughts. And I, res I resonate with this. I'm trying to lead this. We've got a very diverse group thousands of coaches in nations around the world, uh, a high percentage of women, a high percentage of African-American and um, everything uh, else as well, as far as diversity. So 2020 has been a tough year. I'm, I'm leading through some of the toughest times, at least I've ever seen. Um, what do you guys think is the way forward for leaders who are facing some of the toughest challenges they've ever faced? Um. face them I, I i wish i had a good answer um you know i i get a kick out of the fact that that um uh people these people keep talking about you know in these uncertain times well all times are uncertain there's never been a time that wasn't uncertain ever um during these uncertain it's just because something happened that was so shocking that the uncertain the uncertainty of every single day was revealed to you but by the way it's always been that way um and so and so I think the way to, to and, and, and John, you sort of touched upon this, which is, you know, this is the most difficult time is like COVID is the, is, the, is the worst thing that's ever happened. Well, you know, if we lived longer than 70 or 80 years, like if you lived a thousand years, if that was an average human life, this would be like the sixth or seventh pandemic. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. and it's like, wh wh what do you do during hurricane season? Hurricanes are awful. They cause economic damage. They cause loss of life. They're horribly upsetting. They're unpredictable. What are you doing during a hurricane season? Well, we kind of. We know what to expect. We know it's bad. We try and mitigate the damage, and we we batten down the hatch the hatches, and we we know what to do. You deal with it. You you, you confront it. And I think whatever the crisis is, um, you you have to have a sense that it's it. This could have happened all the time. Um, and and the problem is is we we pretend like we're actuaries. You know the housing crisis of two thousand eight. The actuaries had predicted there's only like a one percent or two percent chance that the whole housing market would collapse at the same time. They predicted that there was a percentage, though small. So you know what everybody did? Nothing. They didn't bother preparing because it was only a two percent chance. So why bother having a plan? Then it happened, and panic ensued. By the way, does anybody think their house is going to burn down? Nope. Then how can we all have insurance? It's just because it might. And that's that's what it is to have an infinite mindset. It's it's kind of like living your life with insurance. So the reason you act in service, the reason you build good teams. Now I remember I was speaking speaking to a company once. And one of the leaders, I was talking about leadership, and one of the one of the guys raised his hand and he said, um, this is all very interesting, but you have to understand I don't have time for this. He said, you don't have to send. This is war. Well, first I had to 
correct him that this was not war, uh, that no one was going to die. And uh, the most, the worst thing that will happen is he will lose a big company, a little bit of money. Like this is not war. So once we got that out of the way, I said, I, I appreciate that you don't have time for this leadership during these very difficult, challenging times. My question to you is, what are you, what were you doing during the good times? Because that's when you should be building trust. You don't build trust in the middle of the crisis. You should be building trust all the time so that when the crisis happens, the team already loves and trusts and will go to go to bat together. The military, you don't build trust in wartime. It's all of the training, the peacetime that you're building the camaraderie, you're building the trust so that when you go to war and command and control is necessary, that people are following orders knowing that their commanders are not putting them in harm's way needlessly because the trust was built, not is building. Um, and so I think the best thing we can do one, when we get through this crisis is to be fantastic leaders, to learn to listen, to learn empathy, to, to become students of leadership so that we build amazing organizations so that when the next crisis happens, we'll hit it head on together. We will meet it head on together because that's the only way to meet crisis is as a group. Simon, that's such good stuff you've given us. I just want to top it off very quickly with just two quick thoughts values and perspective uh values that's what anchors us that's the foundation you talked of in your very first question simon it's it's what we stand on and, and perspective is in a crisis people begin to just begin to see the the negative but the, a leader always sees more than others see and they see before they see and and they have a perspective and and i think all the leaders that were mentioned in that question if you look back at it, they were people of values and they they knew who they were and they were not shaken by the times because it and so they had a foundation but they had that perspective that was able to give people hope and it was able for them to they were able to find answers because they were able to it's the it's the peak to peak principle make your make your decisions on top of the mountain, not at the valley. You could see so much more. And, and so those are two, I think, great words to kind of help us understand what the kind of leader that's needed values and perspective. So anyway, go ahead, Mark. Hey, well, well, gang, uh, I know you've enjoyed this last hour as much as I have. Um, I hope not only will you listen in again, I hope you will share it. I hope you'll get John and Simon's message for the world out there. Simon, uh, I want to give them two ways that they can stay connected with you. And the first one I'm personally excited about because in Birmingham, Alabama, me and you and John, we're doing a Maxwell Leadership Podcast. And John and I looked at you and said, Simon, what are you doing about the podcast? You said, I'm not doing anything. And we kind of figuratively slapped you on the butt and said, Simon, get in the game, dude. Everybody needs to hear about you. And you've done it. You've done it. And so Simon has a podcast now called A Bit of Optimism. And if you have not subscribed, you are behind the game. You need to subscribe to this. And so you can go to Simon Sinek dot com forward slash podcast and you need to register for that simon thank you seriously authentically thank you for getting in the game uh, john and i welcome you in and we're glad that you're here uh, there's a well, well thanks thing, simon, thanks, for thanks for kicking me in the butt thanks for kicking me in the butt to do it <laughs> we all need that. hey secondly simon yeah dude, simon you've got some online learnings that i want people to get yeah. access to will you tell us a little bit about that and how to get there yeah, thanks so much. The well, it's it's the pivot that I talked about at the beginning, which is um, we can no longer do live anything, and so we still had all this these wonderful people. And I reached out to people who I have been the people who I literally reached out to and said, "Hey, how are you dealing with this? By the way, you're teaching me good stuff. Can you teach it to to other people too?" And so we we put together these classes, and it was really important. Um, even though lots of people are doing the whole online learning thing. Um, it was really important to us that we maintain the human connection. All of our classes are live. Um, it's a real classroom with real human interaction. That was really important to us. And we 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 have a uh, um, we're trying we've been trying really hard to pre present classwork that builds on everything John and I have been talking about today, um, and meets people where they are um, right now. Really proud of it. So um, and there's a lot of really good stuff there. So um, thanks thanks for thanks for help, uh, giving me an opportunity to share it. Do they go to simonsinic.com? Yeah, yeah. Simon. Just go to simonsinic.com and there's all kinds of buttons that say live classes. Um, Beautiful. And uh, and and we they, we have one class that I'm really proud of called Jumpstart Your Why because we know um, uh, 
in this time, a lot of people really want to connect with their why, especially um, if they've been furloughed or, or, or lost their job. And so we pr we have the Jumpstart Your Why uh, class as pay what you can. We don't know what people's resources are available right now. And so we're letting people uh, pay what they can. And I'm really proud of that. That's very good. Your team is telling us about that. I love that idea. Hey, um, so go to Simon Sinek dot com you'll be able to get some of this online learning uh he's got it they're really sensitive to what's happening in today's world uh also subscribe to the podcast prove john and i right that simon should be in the <laughs> podcast game. and yes. then john has challenged us with his leadership content because there's such a need from a leadership mindset to create a micro learning you can get a small bite-sized learning of john's content leadership at johnmaxwell.com leadership. It'll help you. Finally, John, I'm excited to tell you that the leader series that we're doing right now, it, it continues next week on this series, June the 15th, Casey Crawford, the CEO founder of Movement Mortgage is going to be with us. Now, Simon, I'll tell you offline about Casey. Brilliant, brilliant leader growing now. What he's doing in his community is unbelievable. He's in an infinite game and he and you need to change the world together. But gang, June the 15th, Simon Sinek, thank you. John, any last words and any appreciation to Simon? Yeah, a couple of things. Thanks, Simon. And you also need to get his book, The Infinite Game. I Mark didn't emphasize it like he needed to. He just skipped right over my suggestion. So I'm telling you, you need to get the infinite game. And, and, and <laughs> since Mark, you and I are helping Simon all the time, get podcasts going and other things, let's connect him with Casey Crawford because I'm telling you, the moment you meet this man and see what he's doing for his community, he's built a business. He's built a huge business based on the fact of adding value to people and improving their lives. The guy really has his values together. So. Here we are, Mark, just helping Simon all the time, just, you know, finding out where this wondering you guys are is, amazing, bringing him home. Thank you. Him home. Hey, the, Simon, the, the feeling, the feeling of I, I love you, John. It's been it's thank you for having me on here. Thank you for giving me a platform to share my ideas. It's I learn every time I interact with you. I'm, I'm just a little bit wiser. And I learn something every time. Just such a joy. I, I really love you. Thank you so much. I love you, too, my friend. You're very special. Thanks a lot for being with us. Thanks, guys.